Good morning. Welcome. My name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Alliance Church. And I'm Carissa. I'm the special needs ministry coordinator. Yeah, you'll hear more from her after our worship service um, about what that's about and what she's doing these days. Uh, but I just first want to welcome you. If you're new, you're visiting the first Sunday here, welcome. We do have a gift for you in the back. It's in that little welcome uh, booth right behind, right here, straight back. You'll see it. It says welcome on it. Stop by, get some info, grab the gift. And if you've been here a long time and you want a gift, uh, I would say uh, leave our church for a week. You know? Come back in two weeks. I don't know. Maybe that'll work. I don't know. You can try. So you give it your best shot back there. Um, you might notice, too, this morning, especially if you're new, you might notice this. Our service this morning might be a little bit louder than normal this week. Uh, Carissa, why would that be? Yeah, so this week, we, for Discoveryland, we just have our birth to three kiddos down there. So next week, next Sunday, our Discoveryland launches for the fall. And I don't know about you, but I'm in Discoveryland for most of my time, and it has been so quiet not hearing our kids worship and learn about God, and I'm so excited for the kickoff to happen because I just have missed watching them, and it's just so fulfilling to me to see them just love on Jesus. Yeah, yeah, so it's quiet in Discoveryland, mm -hmm. but you might hear some chirping in this room this morning, so, yeah. yeah. Wonderful, I'm gonna pray for us for our service, so if you're able, um, I would love for you to stand with me. God, thank you so much for the ability that we get to walk through these doors. Um, I know that everybody walked through these doors. It's not here by accident, Lord. There's a reason that you've brought them into this building. I pray that today there would be a sense of community, and if there's any loneliness that is being felt by anybody in this room, God, that you would just give them a sense of community and togetherness that we have amongst each other, Lord. I thank you for the message that you're gonna bring and this time of worship that we're gonna get into, Lord. And I pray that you would focus our hearts and our minds to you to be able to praise you and worship you. In your holy and precious name, amen. 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 Let's worship together here today as we sing some songs. Your name prevails, Jesus 
Amen. Come on and give him praise for his promises here today. We trust you, God. how we sing songs like that where we say that we can count on God, we can depend on him. You know, when we come in this room and we worship, I'm very aware that what we're singing is is not about us. We come to offer a sacrifice of praise and to offer our worship on these altars of our singing every single week. But I'm also reminded when we sing those songs and that it's for us to be reminded that God never fails us, that we can always count on him. And I want us to sing another song here today that, that reminds us that it doesn't matter what's going on in our life and, and the troubles that we may face, that we can always depend on God's goodness. So Julie's going to lead us in this song here today. God, would you remind us of your goodness as we worship you? And we offer up this worship to you. I love you, Lord. 
Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. At home, sing it with us. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. you up, Jesus. You are worthy of our praise, our honor. We're a creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to live one cry. Then from north to south and east we hear Christ be magnified. We'll be magnified in this house. And where the whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea to sky. Oh, then from rivers to the mountains. We knew Christ be magnified. So we sing this. so glad that you're here with us, that we can gather here in this room and at home, wherever you're watching, you can go ahead and have a seat. Well, in a minute, uh, I will pray over the offering and the tithes that have been given, uh, that, or that will be given online even today. Um, before that, I wanted you to hear from uh, Carissa, who's our special needs coordinator, and I want you to know, if you've given even a dollar here, uh, you're a participant in what God is doing in what her ministry is about, which is helping those with special needs. If you know this, special needs ministry has been a part of what is our Dare to Move um, initiatives. And it's a, a core part of what we're doing here. And because of your generosity, because of what God's done through you, we're able to bring her on full time to do ministry here. So Carissa, would you share a little bit about what God's been up to in your ministry? Yeah, it's, it's been amazing just to be here just for, I mean, I've been on staff since about November, and just to see God work in the special needs ministry has been absolutely incredible, and I'm so blessed to be a part of that. Um, 
I don't only just work in Discovery Land with our kids. We also have special needs on our Tuesday night programming for Awana. We have special needs ministries within our greenhouse, which is middle school and high school, but we also have it for our young adults, um, and we plan to hopefully branch out in the future for even more opportunities, but it's not just the kids that we get to watch God grow in and um, impact, but it's it's generational throughout our entire church, which has been amazing. Um, we are providing an opportunity for people to feel included, and we're providing an inclusive opportunity where many of you guys may not know, but 20% of our population have special needs. So we're providing an opportunity for a large portion of population, and being a part of that and watching God grow in that is is incredible. We've had, um, in the past two weeks, we've had five families reach out to be a part of our ministry, which is incredible. Um, and so a big part of what I do is I get to help coordinate all that. I get to help find the volunteers that get to be paired with our students and um, our young adults and just to watch them grow together and watch not only God work in our special needs community, but also our volunteers' lives as well. One story I would love to just share with you is we have a, a family that came into our ministry earlier this year, and um, after being here for a few months, their son gave his life to Christ in Discovery Land. Um, and because of that, mom is able to come to church. Not only is our ministry for our, our students and our kids, but it's also for our families that get the opportunity to come to church when they may not have had that opportunity prior to that. So being able to come here and, and get fulfilled and hear wonderful uh, messages and be filled with God's word allowed her to make the decision to be baptized. So we saw their son gave his life to Christ and shortly after that, mom was able to be baptized um, since they came here, yeah. You know, uh, Chris and I were talking about this this week, and I actually got to be a part of a baptism of a young man who has special needs. Just a couple weeks ago, you'll see the uh, the, the visual, the video story of that um, on October 2nd. Uh, October 2nd is our Vision Sunday, where I'm going to be up here. We're going to be sharing a little bit about what God is doing in the other Dare to Move initiatives that you've been giving generously to. Uh, but I want to talk specifically about baptism. We're going to do baptisms on October 2nd. Now, I know that sounds like four weeks away. It sounds like a long time away. But there's a lot of things we want to do between now and then to get people uh, prepared for that and to get people into that uh, group who are going to be baptized. And let me say this. Our team this week rallied for you. If you're one of those people that God works in your, in your life last minute... <laughs> God knows he's got to just put it on your list at the last minute. I want to invite you today to register to be baptized on our Vision Sunday. Listen, nothing epitomizes our vision better than baptism. It is the picture of a transformed life. Baptism is a symbol of an inward reality that already took place where you go underneath the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, what he did on that cross, and you come up a new person. It's the symbol of what God did in your heart. And if this is you, I want you to look at what with the information here. I want you to take a picture of this. I want you to go and consider to be baptized and sign up this week. Listen, baptism is one of those things that if you're not baptized and you're a Christian, here's the thing. You don't got to pray about whether or not God wants you to do it. <laughs> Jesus has already commanded it. It's a commandment. You don't have to wonder if he wants you to or not. It's a commandment. And here's the truth. No commandment from Jesus is hollow. It's empty. Jesus doesn't waste your time. There is always something across the border from obeying a commandment of Christ. God wants to either do something in you or through you. Every single time you say yes to one of his commands, and I want to invite you this morning that if he's knocking on your door and he says, hey, I want you to trust me in this. I want you to step out in faith and do this. Your local church is right here behind you. We'll be ready to receive you. So sign up for that. Let me do this. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for our tithes and offerings. Let's pray for our special needs leaders and volunteers and students and kids and families. And then we'll continue with worship. Heavenly Father, first, I recognize this morning that uh, everything that has been given and everything we're going to be able to give is actually something that you've already given to us. Everything we have comes from you, all of it. 
So, Lord, I thank you for the privilege to have something to give. I thank, every, I thank you, Lord, for everyone in here. I, I want to be especially thankful for our brothers and sisters with special needs, Lord. You have used them mightily in this church. You've used them mightily in my life personally to show me your love and grace in a way I would never have known otherwise. And so, Lord, we pray for more of these uh, students, these families, people with, that have special needs. We pray you'd bring them here. Lord, would you bring them into our lives to help us learn more about you? Lord, would we be able to care for them well? Would you give us the right leaders and the right people to support these kids, students, adults? Lord, we ask all these things in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It was uh, 1982 this year, this week, last week I was going into the 60s, I think. But 1982, uh, myself and probably five or six Moody students, I was at Moody Bible Institute at the time, uh, we were walking into the John Hancock building, its, its lower lobby. Now, the John Hancock building at one point was one of the largest buildings in the world, uh, not so much anymore, but still massive, massive building, 100 plus stories. It's right on Chicago's Magnificent Mile. It's got the Water Tower Place in it. It's this very upscale, very uh, fluent uh, shopping type area. And a very busy place, like all the time. But we're walking in. It's probably Saturday late afternoon with five or six Moody students into the lobby. And there's like escalators going in every direction and people everywhere. And we started singing for whatever reason, we were, you know, we have no inhibitions. We'll never see these people again. And so we just started singing. And it was a very popular song at the time. It was sing, sing a song, sing out loud, sing out strong. So we were doing that. And, and crazy thing happened. I mean, the song was real popular at the time. But down, coming down one of the sets of escalators were a, a group of tourists. And they had their cameras on. And they joined with us. They were singing. And then over here, there was a youth group that was from some place. They were there at the water tower, and they started joining with singing. There were some moms and their kids. They were singing, business people. It was, it was something out of, like, candid camera, or, you know, it was a flash mob sort of deal, perfectly choreographed, but we had no clue where this came from. And we were all just joining in. Now, there were thousands of us singing. I don't know how many were singing. But there was a bunch of people, and we were all singing this out. And, and afterwards, you know, we just kind of dissipated. We went our own way, and the song stopped. And it was just such a fun experience. You know, I, I thought, wouldn't it be uh, amazing if there was a song in all of our hearts that kind of transcended what just, I mean, just happened. We, we put aside uh, generations and ethnicities and races and, and one level geographical boundaries and socioeconomic and political. And we were all just sharing this very special moment of humanity. Would there be, is it possible that all of, of the world is supposed to have such a song in their heart that would pull us together? Have you, have you ever thought about singing? Singing is just an interesting sort of, of deal. And have you ever thought about why we sing in church? I mean, where else do you gather a bunch of folk uh, to sing for 30 minutes on a weekly basis? Yeah, we're just gonna we're just gonna sing. How about it? You want one to sing? Yeah, let's just sing. I mean, there are choirs and that kind of thing, but you have to try out, and I would never make it. But but either way, they have an ultimate goal of performance, and then you pay a lot of bucks maybe to go to a concert. But the goal in going to a concert isn't to sing, really, it's to listen. But here at the church, we 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 sing. And you wonder, well, why do we sing? Have they always done this? This is kind of a strange sort of, of thing. You know, music is a really wild thing in the Bible, and it is all over the pages of the Bible. 
Uh, in Job 38, it says that when God was creating the world, the angels were, were singing. We find, we find uh, as soon as they get out of Egypt, the, the Israelites stop for a song. When David comes back after killing Goliath, there's a gal's chorus that meets him, and they're singing a, a, a song. And Mary, of course, Junior I Mary is going to bust out in song at the announcement of Christ's conception. And senior citizen Zechariah is going to bust out in song when John arrives. And a group of angels show up to sing, a choir of angels, to a bunch of shepherds when Jesus finally arrives on, on earth. In the Bible, you've got songs written by Moses and Miriam and Hannah and Deborah and Barak and David and, and Asaph. Uh, you, there's, there's music everywhere. You know, in the New Testament, there are hymns to Christ in the Gospel of John, in Romans, in 1 Corinthians, in Philippians, in Colossians, in 1 and 2 Timothy, and in Hebrews. Music is everywhere, and I think it's just interesting that the largest book in your Bible is smack dab right in the middle, and I'm guessing if we took a survey, just guessing, but if we took a survey, the most beloved book in the Bible is a book of songs. Music is everywhere, but you start saying, okay, that's fine, but why do we sing when we come together? Have they always done this? Today, we're beginning a new series, Why We Blank Together, Why We Sing Together Today, and it's going to be just a short series, but it's kind of like a, a theology of the church in some ways, and again, today, we're looking at Singing, have we always sang together? Has the church always done this? And I think so. You know, a gentleman by the name of Pliny the Younger, he's a secular guy. He was not a Christian by any means. Matter of fact, he was a governor in modern-day Turkey, around 100, and his job was to round up those who claimed to be Christians and put the knife to their throat or their family's throats and force them to recant Christianity or be killed. This was his job. He was a governor. And he writes back to the emperor of the um, uh, Trajan of the empire, Roman Empire. And, and he, this is what he says. Uh, fascinating. This is dated around 110, which is pretty significant when you think that John finished his gospel in like 90. So this is just a few years after John finished writing. And, and, and Pliny says, they, Christians, we're accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn. It's probably the Lord's Day, Sunday. They start meeting on Sundays, right, from the resurrection. Before dawn, because Sunday was a work day, like every other day, and work started at sunup, and so if you were going to meet, you had to do it before uh, dawn. They had some meetings in the evening, too, but they were honoring the resurrection. And they would sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a God, and to bind themselves by oath not to commit fraud and theft and robbery, etc. So the early church was a singing church. We've always done this sort of thing. Now, no doubt it looks a little different as we did today. But we want to take a few moments this Labor Day weekend to just look at a short New Testament text, probably the clearest text on why we sing in a church, why we sing when we get together and the goal, obviously, as we check out God's word this morning, is to enlighten us, help us to see and understand why we do this. If you got your Bibles, if you'll turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, or just locate it on your, your phone. We're going to be spending most of the time right here, although we'll spring off out of this a little bit. But let me, let me read the text. You'll see it up on the screen if you don't have it, and just kind of soak it in for a Kind of land on every word as much as you can, and then we'll unpack it. He says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, let's just go back and look at this, this text for a moment. Some really critical things we notice about singing. First of all, we notice that singing is wise, right? 
Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You need to know that singing, when we sing in church, it's not an issue of giftedness or talent or I'm into it today, or I like the style of music. It's, it's, it's none of those things. It is an issue of wisdom. Uh, we might think, well, why in the world, why, God, why does God think this is wise? Well, maybe, just maybe, God knows something we don't know. And something happens when we sing that could never be accomplished without the singing. And as we trust him, we also notice that singing is uh, it's wise, but singing is also the Lord's will. You, you see this. He says, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We can understand God's will. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts. You know, it's interesting. We want God's will. A lot of folk will keep, a lot of key pastoral counseling stuff is they want to know God's will. We want to know God's will. And we just have to be reminded God's will runs on two tracks, right? There's the revealed will of God. That's, that's everything in here. That's the revealed will of God. You know, what God tells us our values should be and what we should do and what we shouldn't do. That's the revealed will. And ah, we're not always so interested in that. We're really interested, right, in the unrevealed will. You know, should I take that job in Toledo or Colorado Springs? Well, it's, it's always Colorado Springs, so now it's an easy one, but th there's that. And, or, you know, should I get married? Should I, 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 I go out with, with him? Should I, which school should I go into? Should I take this promotion, even though it means I'm going to have to be away from the family more? Lots of questions that we want. God, would you give me wisdom? But here's the deal, just so we, just so we know. Here's the deal. If, in fact, you ignore the revealed will of God, why do you think he would reveal more of his will to you. You haven't done anything, right, with, with what he's already revealed. And, and the real kicker is, if you're not interested in this part, you know what, you probably would not be interested in what you have to say about these things either. If we want God to reveal to us that which is not revealed, then we need to be responsive to what is revealed. You want to know God's will for your life? I can tell you, I can tell you. It's saying is God's will for, for your life. He knows how he's gifted you or not gifted you, and his will for you is to sing. God's will also, this is fascinating, is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. It, it's the Holy Spirit's wor working. Look what he says. Don't get drunk with wine, uh, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. You know, there's lots of confusion about the Holy Spirit. And a lot of folk will take a lot of uh, supernatural manifestations uh, and out-of-the-box sort of demonstrations and attribute those to an evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. But the Apostle Paul here tells us some evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit, doesn't he? And a key evidence of the Holy, being filled with the Holy Spirit is to sing. To sing is to be filled with the whole Holy Spirit. It's kind of a, a fascinating sort of thing because God's people when he creates us new he puts a song in our heart number one command we find in Psalms sing to the Lord a new song God's people have a a new song there we're singing people also you notice with the text that this is a command not to the Ephesian elders or their worship team this is a a command to the body this is this is singing is for the body it is for all of us, it's not just for these folk up here, right? They're gifted and they're good and they've got a calling, but they'll tell you right away that their job is not to perform. Their job is to lead us. Now, we've got to be responsive. We, we may or may not, but that's their, their job. Please, this is for us. God's will is for you. You know, I've heard people say, well, God has not given me a good voice. Well, you, you, they're missing it. You're, you're missing it. It's not the issue. It's not did God give you a good voice. It's did God give you a song. And if you're redeemed, he has given you a song, and he expects you to sing that song. We sing with our hearts, according to this text. And this is really, really critical, right? He says, um, uh, addressing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody uh, to the Lord in your heart. And what he's getting at is simply this. 
we're singing some pretty lofty words on Sunday morning. God's saying, yeah, but do you believe them on Monday morning? You're singing some pretty amazing things on Sunday morning, but are you living them out Wednesday morning? It's scary verses, but, but if Isaiah 29, 13, he says, the Lord says, these people, this is his worshipers, his worshipers, come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. And then Amos, get this, is, this is more intense, Amos. Five, he says, even though God's talking, you offer your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fat animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen. When we come and we sing these great lofty words and it's coming out of our vocal cords, but it's not coming out of our heart. God, I think up in heaven is doing, he's saying this. Hey, 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 shh, shh, shh. I'm not listening. I'm not, da, 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 da. I'm not listening. Don't go down that road because you're heaping coals of burning fire on your head. You're living in hypocrisy. Don't sing what you're not there. And I'm not saying that we always feel really spiritual on Sunday morning. Sometimes we just don't. Sometimes the best prayer we can pray is, God, these are the words here, and you know where my heart's at, and I want these to be true. And so I'm, I'm singing this. You command me to sing as well, but, but boy, I'm struggling. I think God honors that. But when there's such a gap between my vocal cords and my heart, God doesn't honor that singing. According to the parameters of the text, it needs to incorporate our heart. It also incorporates our head. He says, right, he says that we are to uh, address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your hearts. You know, nobody that I've been able to find really has a clue what the differentiation is between these three categories of Music, songs, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Uh, there's some inferences to the etymology of the words, but nobody really knows. Uh, different styles, maybe? I don't know. But there's one thing that, that everyone's in agreement what, what it does mean, and that's that the words have to be so entrenched in the word of God that the words of these are sometimes they're just psalms. They're straight up out of the Psalter, verbatim word of God. Sometimes they're a paraphrase an accurate paraphrase of what scripture teaches, sometimes could be a testimonial type of song of how they have incorporated the principles of the word of God. But the, the words have to be uh, directly from scripture. It's very, very important. So you want a prayer request, you'd be praying for the folk who are up here who this is their job because there's a lot of stuff they have to wade through. We don't pick music just because it sounds good and it's toe-tapping and it's fun and we like the beat. N not at all. We're not saying, we're not, you know, we're not coming here saying, hey, we're going to start off with some uh, Taylor Swift this morning and then we're going to go to do a little Ed and we're going to close it down with that Elton and Britney song. That we're to, the words have to come from the word of God. Incredibly important. And don't be thinking, I know some of you people might be, because I'm kind of in that category, those new modern songs, oh, twaddle, quasi-heresy at best. You just need to know, you just need to know that modern songs do not have the market on quasi-heresy. A lot of hymns also have some very ambiguous or some very questionable theology. And so we need to be reading, we need to be singing, we need to be speaking the word of God. The songs are, are from the Lord. Now, we still, we have not a answered the question, have we? Yeah, but why do we sing? Why do we sing this? Well, several reasons, I think. First of all, we sing to learn. You know, when, when we sing, we learn. Colossians 3.16 is the parallel passage to write here. And Colossians 3.16, look at what Paul says here. It's really Interesting. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God, teaching and admonishing one another. You know, there was a fourth century church father guy by the name of Athanasius, and Athanasius was really intrigued with this whole, this whole singing thing. 
and he would ponder, why does God say this is wise? Why is this God's will? Why do we need to do this? And of course, one of the first reasons people give when we say, why do we sing is, well, it's a form of expression. And Athanasius would say, well, okay, but, but that's not primary. Not primary expression, primary impression. In other words, as we sing the words of Scripture, it's, as we sing this theology, we're learning. I mean, how many of y'all uh, learned, whether it's your ABCs or the fruit of the Spirit or the presence of the United States, you learned something because there was a song. I can quote to you right now everything that's in a Big Mac because McDonald's 40 years ago put that into a little diddly song. There's just something about music. It kind of seeps into our heart, and it takes these words. If I would have tried to memorize this, I would have forgotten it the next day. But it just seeps into our soul. and seeps into the cracks so that we can bring it back. And when we're, we're here, and, and God's word is, is being sung, and theology is, well, this is where we're learning this. I mean, we learn from the teaching, but we learn as well from the music. I remember my, my dad, rough, rough, Tank Sergeant Dad, uh, when he came to know Christ, I was still a little boy, but there was a radical shift with my father. My card playing, gambling, everything at the horse track, drinking dad shifted, changed overnight, and he loved to sing. Who would have thought? And I remember going to church with my family sit stand next to my dad and he got the hymnal and I'm looking up at my dad and he's he loves this when we all get to heaven he's just really he lo- he's really a southern gospel guy and so blessed assurance and my dad sang with everything really loved amazing grace and as a little boy I'm looking up at my dad who I knew believed this I didn't even question whether this was true and in those young years my, My whole life, coming to church, I was being washed. My soul was being washed with good theology, the word of God. We we sing to learn. That's one of the key reasons we sing. We sing to to reflect our Father. You know, I almost didn't throw this one in. But I love Zephaniah 317. So we got to throw this one in. Just check out Zephaniah 317. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. You know, we've got a singing God. And we can say that the reason why we sing to him is because he first sang over us. He's a singing God. You know, there's just something in that spiritual DNA. If he's our father, it gets into his children, God's children, sing. It's a reflection of who he is. And by the way, if you ever wondered on God's love for you, um, you really need to memorize uh, Zephaniah 317. You know, Discovery Land has their DL top 12 top verses to memorize. We should like have a top 12 for the big room, right? Zephaniah 317 should be on it. So you need to get that down when you're not feeling very significant or important or you wonder what God thinks about you. What a a critical verse. Um, We sing because in it we find uh, strength. Well, this is is, uh, critical. You know, there's not a lot of examples that we see in the New Testament of singing. There are at least two, though. One of them is Acts chapter 16. Now, this is, what, what a wild passage. Acts chapter 16, just listen to this. Paul and Silas, they go to this uh, 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 town. They're trying to do, a, Philippi, they're trying to do a, a missionary open air type meetings. They don't, didn't go real well. Riot broke out, right? And in verse 22, it says, the crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrate, magistrates tore the garments off and gave them orders to be beaten with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. It was a a level of torture, basically. And I think it's fair to say that Paul and Silas are having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Things are not going the way they were thinking they were going to be going. And they got to be wondering, as they're in prison, 
what's going to happen to us tomorrow because it wasn't terribly strange for the morrow for them to be met with the executioner. And so they are, can you just try to think through? They've been beaten terribly. They're being tortured. They're, they are in dire straits right now. And so what are they doing? About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. I think that, I, th- I think that, little conjecture, but I think as they think that they're walking through the valley of the shadow, they, they are calling on the theology they know, the word of God that they knew through, through songs they're praising. It gives, it gives comfort. You know, the only other episode we, we find in Scripture of a group singing like this is in Matthew. It's Jesus himself, Matthew 26, 30. That's the Last Supper. And right after, it said, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. When they had sung a hymn, you know what hymn they would have sung? It was the halal, the very last uh, portion of the hymn that they would have sung was Psalm 118. Now, listen, to, now you, you know, and I know what's going to happen the rest of this evening. Disciples don't have a clue, right? But you and I know that when Jesus gets to Gethsemane, he's going to be betrayed, and then he's going to go on trial, and he's going to be mocked, and he's going to be beaten, and he's going to be crucified. He's going to become the sin of the world. He knows this is what the rest of this day holds for him. And so they, they sing Psalm 118. Let me read you just a couple of verses out of Psalm 118. And you tell me if this probably is not a good psalm to be sung before you go through what he's going through. It says, out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. You know, I don't think that it's serendipitously, well, that was, well, that just kind of luckily worked out to be a pretty nice song for Jesus to be singing just before he went into this. I don't think it was a serendipitous deal. Uh, saints through all of history have, when they walk through the valley of the shadow, have leaned back to get the strength and the courage they need uh, to praise their, their, their God. You know, in uh, the book of, of Lamentations, it's a fascinating book. I can hit this real quick. In 586, the Babylonians have sieged the city. Uh, the, the, the Jewish folk in the city weren't coming out. They, they made those Babylonians warriors around the city wait three years. For three years, the Babylonians had to wait in the cold and the elements and the hunger. Every time they got close to the walls, they got arrows shot down on them. Some of them were, were killed. They were, they were very upset. So after three years, now here's the crazy thing. Jeremiah is on the inside of the walls, and he's telling the people, he's saying, he's saying listen, y'all, open the doors. Let the Babylonians in. It's not because he cares for the Babylonians. It's because he knows it will be much better for the Israelites if they do this. Well, the Babylonians outside the walls hear about this, and they think Jeremiah is pro-Babylonian. And so the word is, if we ever break through, y'all, you leave Jeremiah alone. Well, after three years, they broke through. And you can imagine on one level, all hell broke loose, all of the depravity, all of the, the, the lustful hate horror that you can imagine was unleashed on the people of Israel. The, the women were forced to watch as their uh, husbands were, were tortured or humiliated or murdered. The women were forced to watch as their children, some of them little children, just horribly tortured and murdered. The men were forced to watch as their uh, children and wives were ravished. And many people didn't live through this. And those who did, who were of any value, Babylon marched away to Babylonia after they had burned the temple and after they had burned the king's, king's quarters. And when you come to Lamentations, Jeremiah is, they left him alone, though. So he's watching all this. He can do nothing. 
And so after they're gone, he's walking around the stubble of, of, of Jerusalem. He's walking through the smoldering wreckage of what was the temple. Maybe he's walking around where this altar used to be, where sacri- only place to sacrifice for sin. He was walking around where the, the scrolls were kept, and now all the word of God is ashes. That's all it is. He walks over maybe to the palace where David and all the kings were, where he knows God had promised David that there would always be a, a king reigning over, and he's looking at all this. If ever there was someone who had PTSD, it was Jeremiah, and Jeremiah, he, he, he looks at this, and he's probably dealing with it in ways that we might. He says this. He says, uh, her gates have sunk into the ground. He has ruined and broken her bars. Talking about God. Her kings and princes are among the nations. The law is no more. And her prophets are gone. He, He continues on. And he says, he has filled me with bitterness talking about God. He has sated me with wormwood. It's poison. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say my endurance has perished. So is my hope from the Lord. And we would look at that and say, well, probably, I guess, I guess so. And then he does this. He says, says, remember my affliction, my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers this. I'm haunted by this, and it's bowed down within me. He's depressed. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new. Every morning great is your faithfulness. You know, Jeremiah, the circumstances he was in, he, he knew that was not his reality, but he couldn't listen to his heart because his heart was depressed. It was worn out. It was what he had gone through. He had to speak to his heart. So he calls to mind what he knows is true. But how do you do that when you're, when you're neck deep, sometimes over your head in, in grief and pain? Well, one of the ways is by singing. How many generation of folk have walked into church after uh, getting Terrible news where the wheels falling off in life, horrible, horrible things happening just to hear when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. And they find strength. How many, how many people have come to church over the, the years wrestling with sin, maybe some sin that just keeps seeming to get the victory in their life, or maybe haunted over something they did and the consequences. They just can't forgive themselves, but they come to church and they hear, oh, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought that my sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Yes, praise the Lord. He came came in, dejected, but yes, that's right. Or maybe somebody who's just trying. They're trying. They, they want to serve God. But you know what? They're getting beat everywhere they go. Family is not behind them. Work is not behind them. The, the, the enemy is strong and cruel, deceptive and mean, and they just come in beat up. And then they hear, though Satan should buff it, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate. And has shed his own blood for my soul. Yes, that's right. It's in in singing that we find courage and we find strength that we would not find otherwise. It's in singing that we uh, encourage one another. Maybe you're not going through anything horrific or bad or troubling, but you live in life, you're doing your thing, but life is busy. Lots of distractions. We just forget And we come and we hear, there in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. This is a great song. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he arose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his. And he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. I don't know about y'all, I need to be reminded of that sometimes. And as we come, and we're not just going through the motions, and our heart is there, God warms our heart. He grows us. He strengthens us. He encourages us by his 
word sung. Now, Martin Luther said this. I love Luther's quote. Luther said, if you want to comfort the sad, uh, terrify the happy, encourage the despairing, humble the proud, pacify the aggressive, there is no effective means than singing. Finally, singing expresses our praise. It expresses our heart. You know, when you remember you were dating and you really liked the girl, guys, you really liked her. And, and you know what? Is this true? Maybe it's just me. No, it's not just true for me. I know. And you got to tell her. You cannot not tell her. And you're, you, you, it's, in, it's coming out. You, can, you have to tell her. Or maybe you go to a restaurant and it's a phenomenal restaurant. You've got to get on the phone and tell people, but you've got to go try this place. It's incredible. Or you see a movie. Didn't see that coming. That was an amazing, you got to tell people about it. You read a phenomenal book. You've got to tell people about it. C.S. Lewis talks about this. And he says this. He says, we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It, it is its appointed consummation. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete till it is expressed you and I were meant to praise and we can think thank you God for the things you've done and wonderful and who you are and that's great but when we put words to it and when we praise together and I'm here and I'm looking at you singing I'm looking at you singing and I don't even know who y'all are but you're singing about the same Jesus I'm singing about there's a unity. We, we praise God together. You're a good, good father. We need to say that sometimes for his, not for his sake, for our sake, right? And all your ways are perfect with me. Ab absolutely. You know, I've got a, a uh, well, I wasn't in Erie very long. I said, um, just, it seems like it's just about a year. And one Sunday after I got done preaching, I would always come to the front after the service and just kind of wait there. And folk need to leave, they just left. But whoever wanted to talk to me could come down. And one Sunday, I, I saw him walking down the aisle. Uh, he was a dapper-looking 65-year-old gentleman, um, balding, little gray hair, huge smile. And he came just to thank me for the message. I uh, told me his name was Randy Elliott. He was a retired pastor in town. Well, Randy and I became very, very good friends. I mean, very good friends. We went out on a regular basis all the time. He was a, a mentor in, in many ways. He was huge support in many ways. He and his wife, Esther, would, would connect with myself and Teresa. We'd go over there. We would just, it was just fun. It was a very good man. I was at his house one day. He had an a addition built to his country home. Of, it was like a study, great study nook. And I would come out every once in a while for a day or two and just to study and get alone and be quiet. I was there. And when Randy came home that afternoon, he'd just been to the doctor, and he told myself and Esther that he was just his wife, that he was just diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis. Now, I didn't know what pulmonary fibrosis was. Now, he knew, and his wife knew because they had been the caretakers of his father when he had this until it took his life. And basically, his lungs would, would slowly... Uh, break down, degenerate, he would be able to take in less and less and less oxygen until he passed. Well, Randy and I continued to meet, and we continued to hang out and get together, and you could see a, a decline. And uh, a couple of years after that, uh, he was at home. I wasn't there the night he, he passed, but Esther tells me about it, that he was on full oxygen at this point, bedridden. Uh, but Esther was there, and his three grown sons were there, and in the last hours of Randy's life, what they did is they sang hymns. I mean, this guy couldn't breathe, but he wanted to sing. And it wasn't something you decide to do at that point in life. No, it was his whole life was singing praise to God and singing confession to God and, and singing of hurt and re reclaiming and, and rededicating his life through music. And so they sang and they sang and they sang the next morning when Randy woke up in heaven, he had new lungs, and he would need them because Revelation is filled with singing. You know, one of the few things that we do down here that we will do in heaven is sing. And so you just need to not be unwise, 
But be wise. You only have so much time, so use some of it singing with your brothers and sisters. You need to understand what the will of the Lord is. You need to sing. You need to walk in the Holy Spirit. You need to sing. It's preparation for what will be in heaven one day because, you know, when we've been there a thousand years, bright, shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun, right? Let's pray. Lord, it's so easy for me to go on autopilot when it comes time to sing or to check out or to think it's not the most important thing. Oh, God, would you forgive? Would you, would you grow all of us that we might look more and more like Jesus, that we might praise you with pure hearts, that we might learn your word, that we might challenge each other as we sing. Prepare us, Lord, for the day when we'll see you face to face, when we'll join all of the saints from all of history as we sing and worship you. I would ask that that would be so. And God, would you remind us as we go our separate ways today of who you are and who we are in you. May we live that out, that those around us would know that there is a God in heaven who loves them. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a good day.